Now, considering what my pseudo name here on YouTube is, this almost feels like the video I was always destined to make one day, comparing Thor to Luke, I mean. Because, as you can probably guess by my name here, they're not only my two favorite characters in their respective franchises, they're two of my favorite characters from any source of fiction ever. And yes, I did like Thor long before the MCU was even a thing. And, oh, before I go on, I do want to warn you that there will be spoilers for Endgame in this video, so if you're somehow someone who hasn't seen it yet, and also haven't had it spoiled, then that's very impressive, and I don't want to be the one who ruins it for you, so please click away now. Okay, with that out of the way, let me now say that just because I'm a huge, huge fan of both these characters, that doesn't mean my opinion on them is any more valid or holds any more weight than anyone else's. And the reason why I bring that up right at the start here is because these are both obviously extremely fictional characters that exist in fictional realities and have faced fictional, dare I say, ridiculous problems or conflicts at times. Which means, even though, sure, we can easily enough relate to the fact that they face great struggles or challenges in their lives that are similar in at least some respects to ones we might face, none of us are ever going to face challenges quite on their level. We're never going to be able to understand what it's like to have the fate of the whole galaxy in our hands as we confront the Emperor and Darth Vader, who just so happens to be our father, aboard a Death Star. Or what it's like to have the chance to kill Thanos before he snaps half of all life in the universe away. But we went for the chest instead of the head, because we wanted to gloat. So basically what I'm saying here is it's impossible to know with any degree of certainty how someone would respond to such insanely pressure-filled scenarios and what repercussions there might be to their psyches down the road, whether they fail or succeed. And though to have a friendly argument or debate about the way these characters would react is fine and can be a lot of fun even, the truth is we will never know for certain because they're not real and their actions are being decided by people who are real and are writing these stories with the primary intent to entertain us. And one thing you really have to keep in mind when having a discussion like this is that people in the real world will have vastly different responses to challenging scenarios they face in their own lives. I mean, some people break down and fall apart at the smallest of setbacks and immediately give up, while others never give up no matter how many obstacles are in their way or keep popping up in front of them. Some of us are utterly destroyed by tragedy and never find a way to fully recover while others can shake it off with relative ease, it seems, and grow nothing but stronger from the experience. Some of us seem to become bitter and jaded as we grow older, as the harsh truths of life are unveiled to us, while others become kinder and more patient as the years go by, as they realize how precious life and their time here on Earth is. In other words, each and every person is different, as is how they will respond to certain scenarios, as is their belief about how others will or should respond. And as I see it, the debate over how Luke and Thor were handled in The Last Jedi and Endgame respectively is in large part a debate over what exactly makes the ideal hero in the eye of the beholder and how you believe a hero should act or present themselves. I mean, is the ideal hero just that? Is it an ideal? Is it someone who never under any circumstance gives up and never lets failure seemingly stop them? Someone who keeps fighting no matter what and eventually finds a way to win? Is there truly honor in stoicism? Or is the ideal hero someone who is maybe more relatable, someone who lets their feelings show and even wears them on their sleeve, more human and less stoic, you might even say? Is it someone who can admit their failure and even falls and breaks because of it, but still ultimately finds a way to not only overcome the external conflict that defeated them, but the internal conflict that made them give up and question themselves for a time? And so when I hear people say they liked the way Luke was portrayed in The Last Jedi, or the way Thor was handled in Endgame because it was relatable, or made the characters feel more human, I completely understand what they're saying and why they enjoy the character being presented that way, even if I personally disagree with it, which is especially true in the case of Luke, which I'll get to those reasons in a moment. Because, let's be real here, only a rare few, if anyone actually, doesn't let tragedy or their failures truly get to them on some level. Very few people, again if any, can thrive in the face of total disaster or constant challenges and then defeat or mistakes on their part. And fewer still could come out the other side unscathed or an unchanged person after going through such arduous times, even if they actually win in the end. However, the idea that some can or do find a way to overcome without letting it destroy them can be inspiring or give us strength. It can be an ideal to strive for, even though others might say it's an impossible one to ever achieve that it's inhuman to expect someone to always rise above such difficult times in life. 
Luke Skywalker in The Empire Strikes Back, for example, is faced with one defeat after another, after having made one mistake after another. And in that movie, he is soundly defeated and destroyed on pretty much every possible level. And yet, when we see him again in Return of the Jedi, it's clear all his mistakes only made him stronger internally and more focused on his goals. True, we don't know what happened to him in the time between the two movies. We don't know if Luke fell into utter despair for a time before getting it all together again, or if maybe someone or something happened off screen that helped him. We only know what we're shown, and that's all we can truly base our beliefs about the character off of. And in the case of Luke, the movies lead us to believe he has an unbreakable will, and it is his defining trait. In other words, the original Star Wars trilogy sets a precedence for the way the character of Luke Skywalker will deal with adversity, and that is that he will rise above it no matter what. He is that ideal that, for some people, is very inspiring and helps them believe they too, in their slightly more mundane lives, could overcome absolutely anything. Luke goes from a whiny farm boy to a stoic Jedi Knight in the course of three movies, and for some people, there are few stories or heroes more inspiring. Now, does that mean the character of Luke Skywalker would never break under absolutely any circumstance? No, of course it doesn't. It only means the circumstances for that break would either have to be exceptional or beyond extreme, and more extreme than what he's been through before, or that we are presented with a slow erosion of the character's inner strength over time due to either the weight of those past events catching up to him and or new difficult events bringing him down. In other words, in order to make his fall believable, we either need slow, believable character regression, or to see the character endure something unbearable that breaks the otherwise unbreakable all at once. And presumably, it had to be far more unbearable than other dramatic events we've already seen him go through. And this is, of course, the sticking point in the discussion of Luke in The Last Jedi. Some feel the slow erosion of his inner strength is just a given after everything he's gone through in the previous movies and in the time between them. That we don't need to see it, we can just safely assume it's happened over time, and or that the betrayal of his nephew was a tragic enough moment in itself to just break him, or it was the last straw, or the culmination of everything along the way that finally got to him. Either way, that's a hard sale to make to those who firmly believe and want to believe in the strength of Luke Skywalker because of the ideal he represents to them. For them, there's just not enough context or explanation to begin to believe that Luke Skywalker broke. And furthermore, that he went to the extreme of abandoning his family and friends and sought out a slow, meaningless death on an island, while the galaxy he once helped save slips back into conflict in large part because of the nephew who betrayed him and who he feels he failed. Now to shift gears to Thor, and even though I may not love what they did to the character in Endgame or the way it was handled and turned mostly into a joke, at least it does make some sense and gets earned for the most part throughout the story, though it's done in a rather messy fashion. Because when we initially meet Thor in his first movie, he's never lost anyone or apparently struggled with much of anything in his life. He starts out at the opposite end of the spectrum from where Luke starts out, and hence Thor will need a totally different sort of arc or journey to tell a compelling story about him. Simply put, Thor is basically a near-perfect hero right out of the box, and only needs to gain humility in order to become a paragon, or the pinnacle for his character type or to get to the point where there's really no growth left to be had for him, he's already almost at the same point in his journey that Luke finally reaches at the end of Return of the Jedi. Again, he only needs humility, which he does indeed gain at the end of his first movie, and then when we see him again in Avengers, he gains even a bit more humility when he learns to work within the constraints of a team, and not as its leader, which he's likely always been before, while adventuring with Sith, Loki, and the Warriors 3 which means he further learns to set aside his pride for the sake of others. He learns how to follow, which will of course help him learn how to lead as a king one day. This movie just ushers him forward that last little step, you could say. And so when we get to see Thor in the Dark World, he no longer has any flaws and there's no growth to be had anymore. At the start, we see him fixing all the problems of the Nine Realms, his father is proud of him, and he's ready to be king. The only thing we can do with him now is to begin to test him and to take things away to see how he'll respond or handle it, to slowly and rather inconspicuously whittle away and to regress him so he'll eventually have the chance to progress again, or to become even better in ways we didn't even know he could improve upon. And so what this movie does is make him choose between his responsibilities to Asgard and his love for Jane Foster and the world she comes from. It's making this character ask if he truly wants all the responsibility he seems to have accepted, in which we could argue is the right thing, 
or if he instead wants to live his life the way he wants to, and along the way he loses his mother and seemingly his brother Loki, and in the end he chooses his own path, not the one laid out before him. He's then in Avengers Age of Ultron, but this movie honestly does little for the character one way or the other, and it's in Ragnarok that we suddenly get introduced to a character that's almost nothing like the one we first met. And in large part, the change to Thor in this movie was done because audiences didn't respond so well to Thor The Dark World, and they seemed to prefer the quote-unquote funny Thor. And no matter how I feel about making this change to the character, I can certainly admit that funny Thor is entertaining in the movie Ragnarok, which is why I have such mixed feelings about that movie. Anyway, the real story behind the humor is that losing his hammer has completely destroyed his sense of self. He's always seen it as what defines who and what he is, and now that it's gone, he must find a way to still be that without it. He even gets asked in the movie if he's the god of hammers or the god of thunder. In other words, this movie is yet another test for him, and perhaps his greatest one yet. It's all about Thor having to look inward to see if he himself believes he's worthy to be Thor. And in the end, he finds that faith and belief in himself, and he truly becomes the god of thunder without the need of a hammer. Which then makes Infinity War a very curious movie for Thor, as is of course Endgame as well. Because these two movies basically shatter the character after the previous movie he was in made him self-reflect and ultimately raised him up to a new level in the face of great loss and adversity. Ragnarok was by far his greatest test, and he passes that test and seems to come out the other side even stronger than before. Though, to be clear here before I go on, it's not impossible to believe it all, nor is it completely unearned, that Thor begins to fall apart in Infinity War and then reaches his ultimate low in Endgame, because along the way he's lost his mother, father, brother, best friend Heimdall, the Warriors 3 who I thought were his best friends, he watches his home get destroyed and then has Thanos kill half the people that survived that destruction before finally failing to kill Thanos before he snapped half the people in the universe away. So yes, Thor breaking does make sense and it's far, far more earned than Luke Skywalker breaking since we've seen all these horrible things happen to Thor and we've seen him slowly regress into a more comedic character, though again, I think that was primarily done to sell movie tickets but it could also be interpreted as his way of dealing with or masking all of his grief until the proverbial dam breaks. However, it's messy because Ragnarok ends with Thor truly embracing who he is and his own power without the hammer. And then days later in the story, it feels like that all gets undone and he's now looking for a new weapon to kill Thanos with. When the last movie clearly established he doesn't need a weapon and then he initially fails to kill Thanos with it anyway when it really matters, and instead just uses it to execute Thanos later on. And then he uses it to fight a different version of Thanos who he also doesn't kill with the new weapon. So what was the point of him getting it again and undoing this idea that he doesn't need a weapon? In other words, from my point of view, in Infinity War and Endgame, Thor is very much used at the expense of the story in a way that feels rather contradictory to what his character previously went through in Ragnarok, which again takes place days before in terms of the story. It's not that it's unearned or unbelievable, it's that it's not serving his character in the least. Instead, he's very clearly serving the story, and some of his actions and behaviors feel very questionable after Ragnarok, which, yeah, on the surface looked like a straight-up comedy, but beyond the humor was an incredible test for this Paragon character, and one he passed with flying colors. And so, much like with Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi, who also changed radically to serve the story, a lot of this comes down to what you personally believe the ideal hero should be or represent, though certainly a person can have many, many different beliefs on who or what a hero could be, and you don't need to save the galaxy to be one, just to do the right thing when it's not necessarily easy, for example. And so the real question here is, do you believe the ideal hero is someone who's stoic and never breaks? Is that the shining example of heroism still? Or maybe you think that's an old-fashioned and out-of-date concept, and nowadays we should look for fictional heroes that are more human, more relatable. Is today's ideal hero one who fails and breaks, and even gives up for a time, before they ultimately put the pieces back together and save the day in the end? Or can it still be either one, and it all depends on how the story is told and how well it's written, of course. And are the last chapters of the story of Luke and Thor, or the last chapters we get for now, told well and did they do the characters justice, or do you feel that perhaps they were sacrificed for the sake of the greater story, or for other characters in it. Well, that's all I've got for you this time. Now it's your turn to tell me what you think of the way Luke and or Thor were handled. Do you love it, hate it, or are you somewhere in between the two? 
Let me know in the comments below and let's talk some Star Wars and Marvel. And until next time, thanks for watching.